do. Hey. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing well, although I have the most bizarre lighting issue. <laughs> what do you the mean? The app won't connect, so I can't adjust my lights in my house. It doesn't look bad. No one else can see right now, but I can I can see you. And it, it's not bad. I'm just I'm defeated by my lights because the app won't refresh. The app won't refresh? Yeah, my light, I, I have smart light bulbs. Don't do that to yourself. It leads to ridiculous issues of the technology winning. Oh, man. Yeah. There you are. OK, look. Hello. That, that did it, finally. Yay. Yeah. So Hello, everyone out there. Did you see how amazing my chat was during very, very, very adult topics? Yes. Yes. It's amazing. You have a good chat, generally. Yeah, but it, I mean, that stuff can get scary. But that was not scary. They did amazing. This is Dr. Pamela, guys. She's she is a regular on here, um, Hello, and everyone. She has her own channel here on Twitch, and she you could tell everybody about you. I'll let you do that while I'm <laughs> setting everything up too. <laughs> so I I am trying to figure out which direction to look in. Um, I am Dr. Pamela Gay. I podcast with Astronomy Cast and. I have the weird and awesome and sometimes confusing ability to both stream here on Twitch as part of my day job over on the CosmoQuest X channel where um, it's a whole bunch of researchers and research adjacent astronomers who well, are here to put science in your brains. Over on my personal channel, Star Strider, I, I combine art and science and spend a lot of days um, doing things like creating planets like this while discussing ice giants. Um, so I get, I get to combine art and science and do research and it's kind of awesome. And if any of you happen to be going to the Astronomical League conference this weekend, I'll be there. So come say hi. I actually am going to have pocket planets to give everyone who says, hey, you're Star Strider. I know you. If you say that, I will hand you a pocket planet. <laughs> a pocket planet. A pocket planet. Everyone needs a hobby. Mine is confusing people by handing them pocket planets. Well, it's a good thing they're not stars and not blue balls. It's true. I do have a few <laughs> blue planets, which I guess you could call blue balls. Mm. But <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's that's awesome. So there we go. And where's that conference at? Uh, it's going to be up in Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. So check it out. Uh, Google Alcon, A-L-C-O-N, 2018 Minneapolis. And you'll get all the details. I'll be speaking at the banquet. So this is one of your rare encouragements to go eat slightly dry chicken. <laughs> slightly dry chicken, guys. It's mm. always slightly dry chicken. Let's face it. <laughs> so what's been new? What's been some new news in, in space stuff? Anything that's well, that's really interested you lately? I think one of the things that was like, how did they do that? That I encountered, and that was a little too loud. Sorry, everyone. I hope you're all awake. Uh, back on June 2nd, the Catalina Sky Survey detected a little tiny baby asteroid that was just a couple of meters long, like not too different in length than a basketball player. Um, and they detected it just a few hours where, before it entered the Earth's atmosphere over Botswana. And scientists from the SETI Institute out in uh, Mountain View, California, gathered as much security footage, as much dashboard cams, as many cell phone videos as they possibly could, and used the position of where the videos were taken in combination with the passage of the object across the sky to calculate that any shrapnel left over from this exploding fireball would be in this one 200 square kilometer region of Botswana that was described as infested with alligators, snakes, and lions. And they found a piece of the shrapnel and it was like this big. <laughs> and 
I I do not know. I can't find my watch most days. <laughs> and I don't know how they found a piece of of exploded asteroid in safari wilderness. The pictures of these scientists have like one of the guides has a big old gun in case they need it. It's just like just how how did they find this rock i i'm amazed i all the kudos and the photo has like the happiest looking scientist ever his face is going to explode he looks like somebody's grandfather and it's kind of awesome and wow just wow kudos go go team go yeah and so, so slater just said didn't they just find a new comet well that kind of happens every day yeah i think like um, that's a that's a that's a lot of stuff out there. So yeah, so so I have to admit, if a new crater, if a new crater, if a new comet had been discovered, I probably would have just not read that article. Yeah, yeah, and then but they they did have that detection too, though. Of um, well, there's a few things. So that 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 quasar. Yes. So the back in August of 2000 and wait, I'm, I'm talking about the gravitational lensing event. Uh, which quasar discovery are you talking about? Sorry, there are mm. a few. There are a few. Uh, <laughs> which quasar? <laughs> these are the conversations that we usually have. Which quasar are you talking about? It's, um, it's, it's like <laughs> earlier today, it was just sort of like, hey, did you hear Higgs bosons deteriorate into top quarks? And I was like, Okay, okay, I'm I'm gonna move on with that. That's awesome. <laughs> it's the one that um, they were the NSF was using the VLBA, I believe, um, and they were able to get details of a, a quasar that was about 13 billion light years away. Was this the one that was used to confirm uh, relativity? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yes, that that was super cool because that was like a geometry experiment done that spanned light years and the calculations included having to figure out the difference in how much space stretched between two different paths that the light took. Yeah, I think that's it at least. I think, I believe. Well, the, there were there were multiple. This one was super bright, obviously. I mean, yeah, obviously. So, so, I'm scrolling, trying to see if I can do. Was it this one? Was it this one? It's the um, P three fifty two dash fifteen. Three fifty two dash fifteen. There are more. There are more letters involved. There are so many more. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so PSO. PSO. Space J three five two. Uh huh. Uh, I think that's a dot. Or space uh-huh. uh, four zero three four dash four. fifteen. Wait, four zero three four dash fifteen dot three three seven three. What's terrifying is that actually makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> I know. I was just gonna go with the abbreviated version. <laughs> oh, this is a different one than the one I was talking about. This well, is have... another awesome one. There are so many awesome quasars out there. Right now, yeah. There's There's been t- like two in the last week that's come through the news. So I'm, I'm sorry yeah. if I got that confused. That'd be on me. No, 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 no. It was me basically going, I don't know which one, but I know there's one that involves Einsteinian stuff, and I read that article. So I'm hoping that's the one you know. And no, it wasn't. And this one is also very cool. So this is like the brightest quasar thus found, which means it can be one of the furthest found that we are able to readily observe. And and the way this works is it's sort of like if someone uses the super little tiny LED lights to make fake candles at Christmas time, you can see it from the front yard. You're not going to see it very far away. If someone instead goes out and gets like the spotlight and illuminates everything with the spotlight uh you can see that from a hill miles away Mm -hmm. this quasar is that spotlight someone stuck in their front yard and their electric bill is going to be something they can't afford that (laughs) much um and because it can be seen from that hill miles away we can learn about their house and be creepers. Or in the case of this quasar, we can be scientists and be a different kind of creeper and understand how galaxies form in the early universe. A sky stalker. Well, 
<laughs> I went with Star Strider and Star Stalker, but they're not that different. Let's face it. <laughs> Sky Sky Stalker is not probably something we want to use in my chat ever, though. No, no. Probably no. not. We're gonna throw that name out. I feel like that's a really bad suggestion. Yes, yes, it, yes. <laughs> But that was pretty impressive. And so th what they were able to do is, is I mean, what did they, I, I, I think we kind of read this on my stream. I'm not, I'm not remembering like that it's only Wednesday. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm looking at the science alert press release and uh, what they're talking about is using the very long baseline array, which gives us our highest resolution images that we can possibly get of the universe. They were able to resolve this object into three different components. Um, this kind of object, there, there's various different ways you can end up with something that's resolved into different chunks. The most common way is you have a radio loud something going on in the core of a galaxy. And then you have two jets of material coming out perpendicular to the disk if it's a spiral and these things are generally spiral galaxies. Mm -hmm. And those two jets that are coming out at the ends of the jets, they interact with the intergalactic medium and light up with what are called radio lobes. So you have two radio lobes and in the center of those two radio lobes, you have the core of the galaxy itself. This, this is actually the kind of object that I saw in, in my um, dissertation. Um, and this one, uh, the light that we're seeing is more than, it's, it's been traveling for more than 12 billion years. It shows us the universe when it was less than a billion years old. So the cool thing about light, and you totally know the sky is, but just in case anyone in the Yeah, in no, the go audience, for it. I'm, I'm eating. This is great. This is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to eat lunch all you please. want. Please. Um, so uh, I should turn on the uh, chat. Hello, chat. Um, I buried you under a press release. You, you did. Yeah, well, it's okay. You got one question, and I, I, I see it, Rick. Okay. So I will, I will ask her after she's done talking about okay. this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so telescopes uh, are essentially time machines that only work backwards. When we look at the sun, we're looking at light from eight minutes ago. When we're looking at Pluto, we're looking at light that traveled from a few hours ago. This is why the timeline for when Pluto got, when New Horizons got to Pluto versus when we got data from New Horizons getting to Pluto, we're not the same timeline. Now, the further back the look, we look, we're looking at objects that are far away and seeing them as they appeared in the past. And one of the things that to me is super cool is if there's another world like ours over in the Andromeda galaxy and there are life forms with eyes and curiosity like we have, they're looking potentially at our star and seeing the light that was coming from the sun at the same time the earliest humanoids were walking the surface of our planet. It's not possible to build a telescope with sufficient resolution to watch uh, human evolution from the Andromeda galaxy. But the idea that the light comes from that period in our history just fascinates me. As we look at objects further and further back, we're looking more and more back in time. And so we can watch our own universe form mm -hmm. by looking far enough away and it's just kind of cool that thanks to the finite speed of light, it light doesn't move instantaneously from A to B. It kind of muddles along at just 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, so slow. So slow. So very slow. We're so ashamed of, of light. Mm -hmm. um, but as it muddles along, um, that time allows us to look back in time. And it's cool. It's just cool. And seeing things as they were not as they are now. So you get to see things when they're babies. Yep. Um, and then I think what was also cool about that one, I'm sorry, I'm still like chewing on food. Um, All good. Was that we, we didn't, we see that, uh, that this is, this was around the time that there was a reionization of certain gases in that period. So this, this is what we're still trying to figure out is exactly how long and, uh, the start and end times of what's called the age of reionization for reasons that annoy me. Uh, so, 
I'm, I'm such a curmudgeon sometimes. I, when our universe was formed, everything was ionized. In fact, it wasn't that everything was ionized. When our universe formed, everything was pure energy. That energy cooled off and froze out into matter. And we had a wash of particles. And as the universe continued to cool and expand, that energy, those particles continued to condense out. And we ended up with protons and electrons and neutrons and other random shit. And eventually the universe cooled and expanded and cooled and expanded to the point that those electrons, protons, and neutrons were able to look at each other and say, hey, let's join together and like form neutral atoms and do the thing. <laughs> let's do stuff. Yeah. And, and so all these subatomic particles joined together and neutral atoms were created. And our universe was filled with neutral atoms that were opaque and light really couldn't go very far. And the universe was boring. Mm -hmm. And, and so we went from the universe starting as ionized. It, there was no period of ionization. It was just born that way. And then it all became neutral and boring. And then stars began to light up. And the energy from those stars was able to warm the surrounding gas. The ultraviolet, ultraviolet light in particular was able to ionize all of these atoms so that the electrons were like, and I'm out. And the photons were able to say, woohoo, I'm going to go flying now. And this this period of our universe becoming transparent again is called the age of reionization and many of us are curmudgeons about but but the re you don't need it kill it but right. it's still called called the age of reionization um so we're still trying to figure out how long it took sufficient stars to be born to to sweep up all the darkness and and make the universe transparent we know it started in pockets stars formed in pockets right but how long did it take for everything was it moments in the universe's time hundreds thousands of years was it a full billion we just don't know and only by studying light from distant objects can we start to see hints of those places where darkness was still there yep and Joe, I got to commend Joe real quick. Joe has been trying to help answer this question. And Joe, you're not wrong with some of <laughs> Joe's really doing it. <laughs> um, uh, I'll put the question to you, uh, even though, you know, we, we talk about this a lot on the stream. So I, I'm okay. guessing, I'm just going to say you're probably, if we had a bingo, I'm going to say you're going to say conservation of angular momentum. I'm going to say that you're going to say gas rich. And I'm guessing that it's not a perfect uh, flat disk. And we're talking about why are galaxies flat disks shaped? Okay, conservation of angular momentum. Yes, that has something to do with it. Uh, so if you have a blob of material, any old blob, doesn't matter, blob, doesn't matter which, uh, and you shock the material, the probability that your shock is going to be exactly coming in straight on the center of mass of that blob is pretty close to zero. And what's going to happen is that shock, rather than just compressing what you do, is going to compress it and start it spinning. And for all sorts of complicated things that mathematically boil down to conservation of angular momentum. The entire thing is going to flatten out. Anyone who has watched the canonical pizza maker who takes the blob of dough and tosses That's it in the air. air and spins it and makes a big flat pizza. Mm -hmm. um, I may have had two pots of coffee today. Uh, <laughs> Whatever gets you through. It's yeah. amazing. Um, so the same physics, the exact same physics that flattens your pizza dough also flattens your collapsing blob of material that is going to become a spiral galaxy. Now, making things a little bit more complicated, you can end up with two different disks that come in towards one another. And of course, they're going to end up spiraling and mm -hmm. 
as they merge, they spontaneously become, well, they're not going to become this big of a disc, but I have this disc on my desk. Mm. Uh, so if you have your small baby galaxies coming in to join each other in the same plane, they will end up forming a bigger spiral galaxy. Now, if instead they come crashing in uh, at large angles to one another and they're fairly equivalent in mass, they're going to form an elliptical galaxy. Early on, we had a bunch of small things that kind of formed together the way the planets in our own solar system formed, essentially. But, uh, but, but the sausage galaxy did you hear about that? I, I read did. that article on stream and that was the worst article to ever read on stream, but yes. the best because it was the worst. Yes. So that was a case. And here I'm going to reach around me to find a, a moderate sized planet, a moderate sized disc. Yes. Note she didn't say moderate sized sausage, guys. Just note that real quick. And, and to all of you that don't know why my life is splattered with discs of many different sizes, I paint planets. I think I already said that. As I said, I drank two cups, two uh, pots of coffee. Um, and they come in all sorts of different sizes. So early on, you had a baby Milky Way and you had a fairly significant baby galaxy. Mm -hmm. Fairly significant baby galaxy came in at a sharp angle now because this is smaller than this as it came in at a sharp angle it didn't destroy this spiral structure but what it actually did was i had another disc hold on <laughs> you guys are making me laugh it created something <clears throat> a bit bigger and a bit thicker now, proportionally, it would have been even thicker than this. Mm -hmm. And over time, it flattened back out. Um, but the highly elliptical orbits of some of the stars are left as echoes. And our, our baby galaxy that initially came in called the Sausage Galaxy, <laughs> because seriously, but dudes, why? dudes I know. did this research. They did this. And... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, so this little galaxy had a whole bunch of globular clusters. This is not to scale. And these globular clusters ended up, uh, I'm out of hands. They ended up left in highly elliptical orbits, reminiscent of the initial uh, incoming highly elliptic path of the sausage galaxy. Mm -hmm. And, and I heard the noise that means someone just favorited my Etsy store. I also forgot to say I'm running a coupon tonight because I love all of you. And the coupon and coffee. is Skyly's Cares. <laughs> and I have alcohol, so maybe I'll stop being this hyper. I'm going to go grab a beer, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, not before I read. Wait, so the coupon is Skyly's Cares or just Skyly's? Skyly's Cares. Oh, she made it complicated for you guys. I Sorry. It's okay. Skyly's does care. I care so much. Science on stream? I'm in shock. Oh, yeah. No, that's what we do here. We do a bunch of science. Yeah. Um, her and I both. Yeah. Uh, she has her own stream, but she comes on here and hangs out with me. And uh, it's Twitch must be... It's way more fun. It, it, it's, it's so much fun. Um, but wait, here's, here's, a, here's where... Um, okay, so <clears throat> numerical simulations of the galactic mashup can reproduce these features. With the, This is the Sausage Galaxy. In simulations yes. run by the colleagues of the guy, stars from the Sausage Galaxy enter stretched out orbits. The orbits are further elongated by the growing Milky Way disk, which swells and becomes thicker following the collision. I don't even understand this anymore. I understand all of it, and I want to take the graduate student who wrote this and be like dude 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 seriously dude but it, there's um, there's another quote that they said um oh yeah right here so the paths of these stars from the galactic merger earned them the moniker the gaia sausage <clears throat> we plotted the velocities of the stars and the sausage shape jumped out at us just i'm sorry just jumped out at us Dude, <laughs> bro. <laughs> so, I mean, this is actually a thing, guys, though. This helped form our Milky Way. The, the language <laughs> of galactic astronomy is so 
disturbing. I, I actually wrote a blog post that I'm now realizing I wrote in 2008. Great. Um, still valid about the the language of, of our science. So words that I had to scientifically use as part of my research include cannibalism, mm-hmm. harassment, shocking, stripping, and strangulation. Yeah, and we call, uh, you know, there's galactic cannibalism, there's stellar cannibalism, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, there's so many other things, too. I mean, we're we're just... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I just posted the link so you guys can actually see that this is a real thing. Like, this is from the Gaia... Uh, I don't know. Did, what? What? I didn't... I'm not, not even remembering now. It's, it's uh, Gaia and SDSS data. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm now looking at this blog post from 2008, and it is like the most goth description of galaxy interactions ever. You should post it. Oh, it's totally posted. In the chat? Oh, no, no, no. I'm about to do that. Please I'm do. I'm about to do that. Please do. I need to get back to blogging. Space is really cold. I know. I think I need to actually start blogging. You do. You do. Um, cause there's a lot I of things totally I can't say on here the shit out of stuff you wrote. <laughs> cause I can't say it on here. I feel like I'm, I'm a little restricted. If we just blog then we're fine. Goth galaxies. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, that, that galaxy that was like entirely luminous matter. That's the little pink frilly bows and everything. Anti-goth goth kid. <laughs> so we would call that an edgelord nowadays. <laughs> I'm so out of touch with the kids today. It's okay. It's it's good stuff. I, I, I'm always in a state of learning. Um, would subscribe to Skylius RSS feed. Well, I could do it. Oh, I, have, yeah. I have a website, so I can just put it on that <sighs> with all this free time. Um, the Milky Way is emo. So, well, then, then Tiny Rick followed it up by a great question saying, because Joe is trying to explain why galaxies are flat. And, and again, this has something to do with also, you know, being a gas rich system, right? Opposed to gas mm-hmm. poor, you're not going to get that nice disc shape, right? It's, it's true. Uh, so to get the nice disc shape, you need forces that will uh, pull things in, essentially. You need that, that friction. You need those interactions. And if you have just stars, gravitationally, you're going to end up being dead bug shaped. Um, now, you don't need that much gas and dust. What actually matters the most is having this difference in mass. So by having the, I lost a galaxy. Okay. <laughs> by, <laughs> by having a, a large differential in size, uh, even if this one comes straight in, it's not going to completely disrupt the big galaxy. In order to take your big disky galaxy and turn it into an elliptical, you need two things that aren't too massively different in size. So this would not create like a large circular ellipse. This would just create a sausage. Yes. Sausages are actually like part of the Hubble diagram. Great. Wonderful. (laughs) Great. I'm glad they I'm so glad they didn't put that on the HR diagram right next to the blue balls. So these two coming together is going to give you a nice happy elliptical. So someone just said, aren't that you know, I thought there were different shapes and everything. And there are. Oh yeah. So this this is where the Hubble tuning fork diagram comes in. You you've gotta have that somewhere in your cache of awesome. (laughs) My space folder. Well, you like every time I watch you, you have identified all the best visualizations. I'm down with like analogies and words and experiments. You not like know where all the cool things to look at are because I played an audio for like 13 years. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's that. I mean, you're getting put into the Hall of Fame, so um, <laughs> that's kind of a big deal. It's a thing. It's it a is. Thing. Are you talking about the uh, the classification scheme? Yeah, the Hubble is like from E0 to E7, SA to SC, and SBA to SBC. Yep, I got it. Boom, handled. Let me bring it up. It's like small though. 
<clears throat> That's what she said. Sorry, she, I should not make jokes while you're drinking. Uh, let's see. We got this. Yeah, I think that's okay. Okay, let me bring it over here. Because I think I can... I'm not going to even just say the rest of that statement, but um, I'm going to take away my face. Your face is going to be taken away for a second, too. We're just going to... It's gonna all be, good. We're going to be voices. Okay. That's that's my happy place. Yes, so this is the the classification scheme and and this is one of many there there's a few others that have been come that have come along but this is the one i think most people use where e zeros are your they appear to be close to spheres and i remember that because the zero is a sphere it goes to e7 which if you write too quickly looks like a straight line and is mistaken for a one which is how i remember that's where you get the sausages um S0 is your completely flat disks that have no arms. SA is where you have arms, but you're holding yourself. And SC is where your arms are like, we shall make a C because we're like doing the YMCA dance. Um, the B, the SB versions just have a bar in the center. This is indicative of them having some other large gravitational mass nearby that is like, I shall pull on you and deform you to have a bar. Gravity is bossy this way. So are neighbors. Uh, so the SB galaxies all have a neighbor that is grand gravitationally influencing them to have a bar. Um, and again, A, arms are tied in. C, they're doing the YMCA dance with their arms, except they're for some reason doing an S or a Z because they don't have their shit together. <laughs> Perfect. Again, two pots of coffee, people. Yeah, but this is this is wonderful and amazing because a lot of people have not seen that before. Uh, I, I haven't even shown that really. But we're supposedly an SBC galaxy? Yeah, I don't know if we're an SBC. I know we're a barred galaxy. I don't know the current letter that's one of those things that changes periodically yeah because guys it's really hard to i thought we were this one down here but oh wait you guys no one can see but it's going to be below dr pamela but um i thought that was it but again, i'm just it, gonna google i have no pride yes googling is good because yeah uh yeah we think it's a bar galaxy but it's hard because you yeah. can't you can't get a bird's eye view of our galaxy because it's so freaking big and traveling even just to our nearest star system is is just not gonna happen it won't happen guys we're not yeah. there yet and <clears throat> and we don't have super well-defined arms like m51 or something so current understanding is uh uh, SBA often comes up. So this, at least this is what I'm seeing. Let me click a few more things. You said Messier 51? No, 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 no. Uh, sorry. S Messier 51 is uh, a spiral galaxy. It's a grand spiral galaxy. Yes, the whirlpool. It's pretty. It's pretty, pretty. Yes, it's a it's a pain in the butt to take images of, because its core is super bright, and and those arms are like, you can't see us, we won't let you. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this is. This is the the whirlpool. It looks so cool in, in here. With the creeper behind it too. That that is exactly what makes it hard this guy back here uh no uh sorry i'm seeing the image diff so no not well i can't hmm, i can only tell if we're looking face on which which dude it is that causes it there's a bridge of material that you can see streaming off of m51 to the galaxy of blame yeah because there's a galaxy like right next to it yeah, it's the one that's right next to it that's to blame. Um, I just can't tell in this particular because those are physically super close. Yeah, they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that could be the one that is to blame, and we just don't have the perspective in this simulation that we have from Earth. Yeah, because this one, uh, they would say it's NGC fifty one ninety five. Okay, I can. 
We can Google this. We can science yep. this. Yeah, this one's super close. That's ridiculously close. Yeah, this is the one that's causing the grand spiral structure. Uh, yeah. And there's actually a, a arc of a bridge of material between the two different galaxies that we're just not seeing in this particular simulation, but it's there for reals. Oh, man. So these guys are on their, they're already merging. Exactly, exactly. Guys, it's getting very... I want to start playing like sexual healing. <clears throat> um, so helpful to learning. Yeah. Well, it's cool. So, I mean, we have the mice galaxy. What the galaxies? What which one is that again? Uh, I don't remember their numbers. Uh, they they along with the antennae galaxy are the quintessential, not too different in mass uh, collisions that are pretty far along, and you can see how things both come together and get torn apart during the process of mer merger, which has got to be an analogy to something about human life. Absolutely. And, and uh, so, so Rick was also following up, you know, so why, why is it a disc as opposed to like planets that are and, and a lot of people ask this too. So it's not a bad question. Oh yeah. See, they do a good job at showing this. Yeah. Um, that's, that's excellent. pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, but the so so why are planets sphere shaped or not perfect spheres, but instead you have, you know, galaxies that take these kind of shapes or, you know, when they're merging, they're right. very weird. But why why planets? Why why are they in stars? So the, the way to think about it is uh, comparing the asteroid belt and the sun to the Milky Way uh, and the individual planets to the individual stars. So in, in our solar system, we have planets that are gravitationally bound together and they reach what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. This means that the force of gravity saying you shall be a sphere with equal gravitational force all across the average of your surface, this hydrostatic equilibrium dominates. It, it uh, is able to overcome the chemical bonds and minerals. It is able to overcome the us up thrust of plate tectonics and limit how out of the round an object can get. When we look at Ceres, we see a small round object. When we look at much smaller asteroids than Ceres, we see dog bones and flat potatoes. Right. And the difference is these smallest objects, the chemical bonds that hold the minerals together are stronger than the gravitational forces trying to compress that asteroid into a sphere. With Ceres, gravity wins instead of molecular bonds. Yeah, and Ceres is actually really cool. It's like a it's like a little tank. It survived. That <laughs> is true. a survivor protoplanet. That is a survivor. Ganymede's the same way. Ganymede is like the most beat up of all of Jupiter's moons. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. I, I want I, I want to spend like a whole day just talking about Ceres. Um It it totally deserves it. It's the first unmade planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's in it's in the asteroid belt, which is pretty cool. So it's the only dwarf planet that we have in the asteroid belt, right? Well, there, there's a few that would make arguments for some of the other worlds, but it is the biggest of the asteroids uh, dwarf planets. Yes, and very, very cool. Um, someone just said... What are the names of those those galaxies? Oh, the mice galaxies? Uh, so that would be NGC 46... 761 and NGC, I don't know if that's just title, because uh, they're going to be two there. They're merging now. You can just look up the mice galaxies. Um, Papa. And then someone said, uh, Skylace, what's the collision I read we would get to see in 2022 by the naked eye? I don't know. Collision of what kind of objects? Is it maybe an NEO? Um, I don't know. And fuck you, Soda, <clears throat> says, and that's the person's name. <laughs> uh, 
I know that person who's been in here for a few times. If two galaxies are that close to each other, it's basically impossible for them not to be merging one day, or can a galaxy be fast enough at a distance to miss each other? I Yeah, so uh, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, which any of you living in the Southern Hemisphere have the ability to see, they're uh, irregular galaxies that are swinging around our own Milky Way. They're uh, extraordinarily close. I forget exactly how many kiloparsecs, but or megapar. I think it's kiloparsecs. I think they're order of a hundred kiloparsecs away. Uh, and they appear to be on escape velocities, so they're just swinging by, saying hello, changing their direction, and leaving. They're doing the galactic equivalent of what Oumuamua did as it passed through our solar system. Yeah, so someone just said, I think it's two suns. I read they're already touching. We're going to need a link for that article because this yeah. might be fake news, fake space news. And Andromeda oh. and the Milky Way collide in uh, five billion years. Wait, wait. He just sent one from NPR. Yeah, I'm looking at that too. <sighs> a pair of stars in the Cygnus, uh, in the constellation Cygnus will collide. Oh, Okay. Give or take a year. Uh, It'll be... Oh, that's actually really cool. When did they release this? January 9th? Last year. So, two years on, I'm looking for the name of the object, and I'm going to do a search through the archive for it. They predict those two stars jointly called KIC 983-2227. That is what I needed. Yeah. They will merge and explode, at which the stars, uh, stars, star will increase its brightness ten thousand fold, becoming one of the brighter stars in the heavens for a time. And it's then called, it will fade away. Yeah, it's called a red nova. <clears throat> Space is pretty um, good about killing things. Mm-hmm. And while no you're looking, allowed to be famous. While you're looking that up, someone said, and this is true, French. This is actually kind of big news because we were all just talking about this recently. I even talked about it with you, Dr. Pamela. But um, is it true that we found a galaxy lacking dark matter? Yes, totally true. And yeah, I'm seeing multiple papers on how this object is predicted to collide. And it's from multiple research teams. So go collision, go. It'll be bright enough for us to see. But it doesn't mean I, that's going to hit anywhere near here. That's automatically no, what no, I always think. No, no. Like when people no. say, is, what about this collision? That's usually I'm thinking someone's talking about NEOs or something. Yeah, this, this would be visible, but far, far away. And uh, things to look forward to. That's another election year. So we <laughs> need all the help we can get. Um, but it, <sighs> let's see here. So did they say how? So it's in Cygnus. Yes. Uh, let me see. So the uh, undergo merger in 2022.2, so two tenths of the year in, plus or minus 0.7. So it could occur in mid 2021. It uh, could occur Christmas time 2022. I want that to happen. That would be an excellent Christmas present. And it was. Uh, yeah, a whole bunch of different uh, objects are looking at it. Yeah, I tried to just pull it up in Space Engine and I couldn't. How far away is it from us? Uh, let me click on a link likely to have that information. Because they don't list it. It's so weird that they don't even list it. They tell you what constellation it's in, but that's super great. Yeah, a lot of times they don't think through that <clears throat> people want to know these things. Uh, I can tell you it's temperature. Well, it's a red nova. Doesn't that red color tell us something? I That just tells us the temperature that they're expecting the explosion to be, unfortunately. Um, no, they don't want me to know where it is. Okay, so let me... I can Google the, the star name, and you can talk about that galaxy with no dark matter. <laughs> Okay. We can switch off here. We we can do the thing. Uh, <clears throat> so when we're trying to calculate how much uh, dark matter that a galaxy has or doesn't have, what we do is we look to see 
how fast are the stars going at different radii from the center? The further out you get, the more mass is interior to your orbit that is working to get you orbiting faster and faster and faster. Now, if we add up all of the matter, we should be able to calculate the velocity. And the reason we were able to figure out, hey, there's dark matter, is the velocities we observed made no sense. Well, that was true here, that's not true there. In this particular oddball galaxy, and I'm working to pull up its particular name for you, uh, it's NGC 1052 DF2. Uh, it's 65 million light years away. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not that far. And uh, what what's kind of amazing is when we look at its motions, everything makes sense based strictly on what we see. And um, we've never seen this before. Every time we've looked at a galaxy previously, the stars have been going so fast that it indicated there was invisible stuff. So basically scientists <clears throat> got excited because the universe worked based only on what we could see and there was no mysterious un, uh, unexplainable dark hidden material uh, making things move in ways that we couldn't completely understand. We got excited because we understood something for once. Yeah, and that's, I mean, because that's one of the things that we were able to say that we could actually account for there being dark matter. Yes. Was the speed of the stars and, and how, <clears throat> you know, you would think that the speeds would change uh, across the the Milky Way or any galaxy. Um, but, yeah, now I'm posting both. I'm posting two different articles, but this was a real thing, uh, Danny. Uh, I would be careful Googling anything, but yeah, we, we do get press releases that talk about that. So, <laughs> so, so Ben Mill, uh, actually we do have uniform consistent ways to name stuff. Wait, what's this? <laughs> ben Mill's like, can you ask the, can you ask why the IAU can't come up with a uniform consistent way to name stuff? We have that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, so, oh, does he mean like with the KIC and GC? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so all of these are completely consistent. <laughs> um, so NGC is the New Galactic Catalog. It actually is a catalog of objects that were in part started by William and Carolyn Herschel. Uh, this is the dude and his sister who found Uranus. Sa some of the moons of Saturn. Uh, so the new galactic catalog is actually not galactic, sorry, new general catalog, new general catalog. Um, so the new general catalog is actually quite old. Uh, it contains all the fuzzy stuff that was identified for several hundred years. Uh, the times you see HD and HR those are two different catalogs that were funded that are catalogs of stars. So when something has an NGC number, the NGC is New General Catalog, it's a fuzzy thing. It's a nebula, it's a galaxy, it's something in between the two that is fuzzy nonetheless. So you'll have globular clusters that get NGC numbers. Uh, the Messier catalog is another historic catalog. Everything in the Messier catalog also has an NGC number. Uh, HR, HD, those are stars. All of the modern catalogs that we're dealing with. So for instance, uh, the KIC number that came up earlier, the POS number that came up earlier. POS the, is a terrible catalog name. It, it is. It is. It's true. I agree with that. Uh, those particular numbers, if they begin with the J, that stands for Julian uh, date, and it is epic uh, 2000 coordinates. So using its position on the sky with 2000 coordinates, those four numbers dot something is going to be the right ascension. The next set of numbers is going to be the declination. So this tells us where in the sky the object is located. Mm -hmm. The initial letters tell us which catalog it is. So for instance, as part of my dissertation, I worked on the Texox catalog. So everything that I 
discovered as part of my dissertation was tex ox, so T X O X, and then number 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 dot number number plus or minus so north or south for declination, uh, number 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 dot number number number. So the letters at the front of the license plate tell you which catalog it comes from. The if there's a letter before the number that tells you it's 2000 coordinates or 1950 coordinates, if it's a B instead, and then all those numbers are telling you where in the sky you're looking. So it makes perfect sense if you know the secret code. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, we do this to ourselves. I hate it. I had a perfectly good galaxy cluster that looked like a squished starfish and I wanted to name it the starship starfish cluster. And I was told no. They said no. But they what if no. what if you what if you get enough people saying that sounds like a good idea? It's not worth it anymore. But oh, so we can't name okay. anything ever. <laughs> There's so many other things that look closer to starfish. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, let's let, wait. So was that going to be a galaxy that you saw? It was a cluster. Of a galaxies. cluster. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm not going to make I, any sausage uh, jokes there either. <clears throat> no. No. I studied groups of things. So I studied globular clusters. I studied um, groups of, I studied the family of stars in the Earth's minor dwarf steroidal galaxy. I studied the galaxies in clusters. So give me a group of something and I'll study how they evolve. It's kind of what I do. Yeah. And I that's, like databases. Yes. She works a lot with that kind of stuff all, all day long. Um, I studied a huge group of sausages. I know. So that's the, <laughs> I should never, <laughs> this is what happens. Oh man. TwitchCon's going to be just like this too. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> TwitchCon's going to be, uh, uh, if the people would get, okay, I'm going to be, I'm <laughs> not doing it. I if, like cluster <laughs> McCluster face. I really, really do. We should really be naming things together. Um, with how TwitchCon is going to be amazing. Are you going Paranor? Um, but yeah, so we have that and I'm just laughing. Sorry. I just have to recover for a second. You have to, you have to help me out. That that's okay. I, so I, I write stories to go along with my planets now. Thanks mm -hmm. to Fenmill saying, Hey, this would be a good idea. And I was like, yeah, that actually sounds like stupid fun. I'm going to do that. Um, so I have stories like, um, there, there's a planet that just wants you to know that it has hydrated salt and not dog pee. Um, and there's a true blue planet that tries to hide under, it's a true blue friend and it tries to hide under a solid, uh, sphere of ice and hydrated salts, but asteroids keep revealing its true personality. These are the stories I write for my planets. Cause I'm a nerd. Yeah. Yeah. But that's so, fine. Yeah. Well, and then, and then Tiny Rick, you know, Tiny Rick, where, where have you been all my life and my, my streaming life? Because you're at, asking all the questions I know answer. But I want you to still answer this one. So I don't know the answer okay. to this one. I'm going to act like I don't know. So how does a three-star system form and get a stable orbit? Uh, this there is – I know this one because the guy was actually on my dissertation committee who figured this out. Um, unfortunately, he passed away. But I have – his academic robes and they've met Einstein. Um, so I have academic robes that have met Einstein. Hmm. Uh, so this was figured out by Victor Zebehe. The one stable situation is where you have two objects. I, my desk is covered in planets. You have two objects nearby that are orbiting around and around each other. And they act gravitationally as a single object. And then you can end up with a third object farther out that orbits those two. So this object sees these two as a single center of mass. The center of mass of these two orbits or of these two objects orbits the center mass of this object. So these two objects are rotating and this one is going around. Quite recently, there's actually a super cool discovery where there is a system found that had a neutron star and a white dwarf found in the center and uh, these two objects, the neutron star happened to be a pulsar. And since it's a pulsar, we were able to get extraordinarily accurate timings of how fast it was moving. Fast. So we were able to figure out these two are going around every one point, I want to say five or six days. 
And then there's this other white dwarf hanging out out here going around these two and my arms don't go any further. And it's going around in 350 something days. And we were able to work out all the maths of how all of these things are orbiting and figure out that uh, there is no extra term you have to add when the objects have different masses. Yeah. And Science. and we have uh, our Alpha Centauri, the Alpha Centauri system. And you have Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and they're rotating around one another. And then you have Proxima Centauri that's going around those guys. Mm -hmm. So how the heck, Yabajan says, what? How the heck, what? Um, why are your webcam so small? Make the... Okay, they're, they're fine. Um, this woman is a national treasure. I know, she's amazing. <clears throat> and she's mine. You can't, nobody, I don't share science. Ever. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be damned. Yeah, and you know, we have, we have more star systems. I, I just showed people the caster system because that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, there is, <laughs> cheers, Bolotti. Um, we have all kinds of systems. I mean, it's, it's pretty common that, that stars that you see at night, right? Yeah. You have that joke. You can say it. Say I, it. I was thinking about it. You knew I was thinking about it. Uh, so, uh, four out of every three stars is a binary. <laughs> she said so that in chat and my brain was dead. <laughs> it was beautiful to watch. It was truly beautiful to watch. <laughs> I was, I was like, yeah, no, that sounds about right. And then I stopped and I was like, yeah, what? So, so, so the way it works is if you look at three different what appear to be individual stars on the sky, it will usually turn out that two of them are actually binaries. So this is four stars. And then you have this one over here that's alone. So you think you're looking at, oh, man, gymnastics of fingers. You think you're looking at three stars but you're actually looking at two stars, two stars, and one star. And now you know exactly how coordinated I am. That's pretty coordinated, actually. I don't think I could do that. But that's probably coffee. This is a sponsored ad for coffee. <laughs> so I, I was writing a journal article with a colleague earlier today. And because uh, we both have fairly off open floor plans where we work, um, and we wanted to just work. We were writing together. Um, we went to the local diner mm -hmm. and we arrived after the breakfast rush and just hung out because the place was empty. And we go there a lot. And um, they just kept filling our coffee cups, just kept filling our coffee cups, filling our coffee cups. <laughs> and we got the paper entirely outlined, all of the introductory sections of each of the subsections written. It was glorious. Mm -hmm. And this is the result. Wait a second. You know what I just saw here? Mm. I don't know if you've read this press release. You know, I that's from June 12th, and I'm just going to say no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going through here because I'm thinking about the other things that kind of came out. No, there's some press releases you just have to nope, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, a All lot because lately. they put out a press release doesn't mean it's good science. Yeah. Could gravitational waves reveal how fast our universe is expanding? No. <laughs> Negative. Sorry. We're not there yet. Maybe someday, not currently. Yeah. And there is, let's see. So there was something that was really cool that they saw with, um, you heard about the, the footprints, right? With uh, Juno of the moons. The, the footprints on the auroras from the moons. Wow. With Juno. Okay, so my brain went straight to astronaut footprints and then broke. So I'm going to sadly need more words to unbreak my brain. And it's, I'm looking for the press release. It's, I don't have the press release. I just remember reading that. It's only been six hours of intellectual streams for me today. <laughs> so, no, there, there's footprints um, on the, the aurora from from Jupiter's moons, it's Galilean moons. Oh yes, sorry. Now I'm with you. Now okay. I'm with you. <sighs> sorry. No. So <laughs> so what they're finding is there are magnetic fields streaming off of Jupiter, particularly strong in how it interacts with Io. Uh, but they're now also tracking other interactions with the individual moons, and uh, the 
there's lots of different analogies getting thrown out to try and explain the differences in the shape of the aurora that are getting caused by the moons being out there and interfering. And footprints is is one of the words that's getting thrown out there. And this this essentially the way to think of it isn't like stompy feet, right? Footprints, but rather it's it's the shadow it's the effect it's the thing that is a result of the planet being there and interfering with the aurora's shape that isn't what you would expect if there were no moons right um yeah because that was kind of a new thing that that i don't think that showed up in a press release yet um it's in science news they may not have put out a press release uh, and and so we knew that there was significant interactions with Io. That mm-hmm. that was just we knew that. Um, and now they've they've identified uh, that Ganymede is also having a significant effect, and um, they've imaged how Io is affecting the aurora. So these are things that we knew in one case but hadn't imaged, and we didn't really know about the same way previously with Ganymede. Uh, Ganymede's actually bigger than Mercury. This is one of the moons of Jupiter. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's huge. It's kind of awesome. It's kind of awesome. And it's kind of pretty too. Yes. Just I very battered. It's... You just look at it. <laughs> think poor thing. Why yeah. do you have to be next to something so massive? And it's not even, it's not even in the position of Io. It's not Europa, but then it's next. Yeah. Right. It's it's the furthest out of the moons. Oh, really? Callisto I, isn't? Oh, damn it. I could be confusing this. It's the biggest of them. I'm going to stop is. my speaking there. It's the <laughs> biggest of them. It is the biggest. And it, I think it's actually quite pretty. Um, Ganymede's. Yeah. Um, I just started watching The Expanse, and I thought I heard them say Ganymede. They I, they did. That's okay. one of the major characters in, in the novel. Okay. Uh, so Ganymede <clears throat> is just like beat up and beautiful and has multiple colorations and every time it's hit it reveals this lighter material underneath and sprays it out over the surface it's thought that it might have subsurface oceans like Ceres does so if you want to compare Ganymede to something else Ceres is probably the best thing to to compare it to but Ceres is way smaller than Ganymede so how many things in our solar system do they think have subsurface oceans? Like, okay, so we have Enceladus, like all of them. Europa. Um, do Everything we think- but Mars, basically. <laughs> then why? <laughs> <laughs> What's the logic? <laughs> okay, so so with Ceres, uh, the, the logic, I think, is based on the fact that we're seeing volcanoes of liquid coming out of it. Uh, so these are the bright spots in Oculus Crater. Mm-hmm. With Europa, it's based on it has cracks that fluid comes out of, and Hubble thinks it's seen geysers, and Galileo data may have recorded the interference of geysers with a magnometer. Uh, with Enceladus, we've seen the water coming out. We've sampled the water coming out. There is water coming out. Right. Uh, with Ganymede, it's more based on, well, if all of these other things have water inside of them, this probably also has water inside of it. Uh, so it's less solid knowledge of liquid. Mm-hmm. Just to throw all the puns out. So, yeah, because, I mean, they're even saying Pluto, right? Pluto, yes. Pluto probably has a, a subsurface ocean as well. I don't know if they're predicting that it's water liquid or not. I just don't know that. So... Uh, there it's based on the fact that there are floating mountains and that it clearly has heat inside. Otherwise, the surface wouldn't be as pristine of craters as what it is right now. Yeah. Well, this isn't Europa. We're looking at Io. We went to Io. Yes. Io is yeah, really amazing. cool. I mean, we saw uh, one of the things erupt, one of the volcanoes erupt on Io, didn't we? Yeah, so that that was actually seen by Voyager two, and it was I it was not quite uh, not quite forty years ago on Monday. It was July ninth, uh, nineteen seventy nine. Uh, Voyager two swung past Jupiter and sent us back images that captured one of Io's volcanoes erupting. Yeah, and that's I mean it's just. 
I, I just love the Jovian moons, like the, or the Galilean moons, I guess you would say. You wouldn't say Jovian, um, but Galilean moons. The, these guys yeah. are really, really cool. And uh, which one is most uh, – Io or Titan? I would say Titan, but we're also finding – you know, methane's everywhere too. Uh, what do you think – um, well, Io will smell like sulfur and Titan will smell oh, like methane. Pick right. Your stink. Right. Both of those are just no bueno. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever gone to like Utah and like dr driven through like the salt areas? And Permian Basin out in West Texas. That's another one. Yeah. It's not great, guys. AKA methane or sulfur. Yeah. I, I would probably, I don't know. Because well, I. You don't have atmosphere to smell on Io. Io you have right. atmosphere to smell on Titan before you die of oxygen, la la uh, die of asphyxiation from lack of oxygen. Yeah, yeah. And it rains methane also. Uh, and you've got this, yeah. So you get, I mean, Titan has a nice thick atmosphere, so. And and Agrog is correct. They do add the smell to methane. Um, unless there are methanogens around creating the same stinks that uh, get created in the guts of, of critters. Yeah. Are we are we planning on going back to Titan anytime? It's so up in the air right now with JWST getting delayed again. As long as JWST is on the ground, it's going to continue to have a sufficient, a significant construction budget. Once that sucker is no longer on the planet, uh -huh. it will free up a large portion of budget to go into constructing other spacecraft. We just As we long just, as we still have the budget. As long as we still have the budget. Granted. Yeah, well, because it, it's really cool. I can actually see the atmosphere through looking over Saturn. And and the blue is accurate. Yeah. Why is it blue? I'm just going to ask the question because no one probably will. Probably scattering, which uh, effectively means that light gets scattered different colors more effectively than others. The red passes straight straight through to us. And the blue gets scattered all over the place, just like our blue sky. And what we're seeing is actually the scattered light coming out the edge. Yes, I'm sorry. There's, there's Joe's upset about space cookies. Joe's having a space cookie dilemma right now. Um, and so, yeah, so series. Let's talk about series for a few, and then, then I definitely will let us wrap up and get to the rest of. Uh, I've got so. Well, look at, look out. Okay, so look at. They actually did a really good job with this. I think this has kind of been Ooh. updating. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It's what pretty. Have, does it allow you to find Oculus Crater? I mean, we could probably look for it. <gasps> is, is there a bright, shiny crater? Yeah. Well, I mean, this one has a like a dot in it. Yes. That's, yes, that is Oculus Crater. We can so land in it. This, this is a super cool crater. There is a plateau of shiny material that has been possibly uploaded into this. The image is only a couple weeks old, so I'd be surprised if it was in here. Um, but inside Oculus Crater, we see landslides, we see all sorts of amazing normal ge geology that we see on other worlds. But what is particularly amazing is there is a plateau that we haven't identified the exact sources yet, but somewhere on this plateau, uh, liquids that are filled with salts are getting spewed out and raining back down, and it's covering this plateau in salt, and the salt is running down the edges of the plateau. So it's kind of like someone poured highly reflective paint across the surface of the plateau and it dripped down the sides. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that my education ever prepared me to see on an asteroid. Uh, there's also a bright shiny mountain. It looks more like it's just like more of what we would expect of a volcano that spews ice instead of lava. But Again, we weren't prepared to find these things on an asteroid, even if it is a asteroid that wants to be a planet. I mean, it's totally. I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you call this a protoplanet? I would call this a planet, personally. Um, I mean, I feel like this guy. Or wait, it's a it's it's female. Ceres is female, right? Yeah, Ceres is and and the god of cereal, by the way. Right. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, but. 
I mean, not that it really matters. I could I could say whatever I want, but as far as this, I mean, this this planet or dwarf planet, I mean, really did survive really tough time and in that area too. Yes. Where yes. it's just left in these, you know, small planetesimal bits that we're not enough massive to ever have the hydrostatic equilibrium. I mean, this this thing has that. Um, but definitely, I mean, it doesn't, uh, as far as like the IAU would say, it wouldn't clear out its own neighborhood. I, I hate, so I'm, I'm a like full-fledged voting member of the IAU. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to say the 2006 members of the IAU, uh, the society is by necessity getting younger as the older generations are dying. Mm -hmm. uh, in the field of astronomy, the average age of retirement is over 70. Uh, we're a very, very gray field. Very, very, very gray field. And so to the cranky individuals back in 2006 who voted, uh, the definition they came up with was imprecise. And the justification for having the argument at that time was just to try and figure out who got to name the new giant objects being found by Michael Brown. And the Planet Naming Committee wanted to name it. The Kuiper Belt Naming Committee wanted to name it. The two committees fought over who named it. So we had to define what is a planet. That's the definition that came up. And I'm pretty sure that it's uniformly disliked. I don't think we're voting, voting to get a new planet this year. Not a new planet, voting to get a new definition this year. I am going to be the editor in chief of the IAU newsletter. So as soon as we know what the heck we're voting on, I will be able to let you know. Good. Good. You guys heard it here first. Yeah. We're gonna be wow, astronomy politics, cool. Oh, she knows all about it. I mean, this not this cool. it, it that and that's not cool, but it is it is something. I mean, there's a lot of politics that happen in with space. We have did you see our new meme emo? No. The Space Force one? It's a meme. You have to laugh at stupid shit. You have to. I, I try. So space force. Look at just... this. Look at the. Look at the chat. Just okay. look at. Look at how. Oh God. I know. <laughs> it's so amazing. See, look at how many people are so excited about it. See, I. I am personally, this is me speaking as me, me speaking totally as me, me speaking for me from home, from my home computer, on my home internet, on equipment I personally have purchased with my personal money. This is Pamela. <sighs> yes. All the disclaimers in place. Mm -hmm. I am utterly terrified that the development of protocols that would have to go into place to create a space force will eradicate the funding that goes to the part of NASA that does a lot of the stuff I care about. And I want to have a job and I want the people who are doing work I really, really respect that isn't studying one of the worlds that we're potentially gonna go put people on. Um, I want those people to keep doing the spectacular things they're doing to explore not just our solar system, but all the rest of the universe. It's not the Earth, Moon, solar system, and beyond. It's planetary science. It's astrophysics. It's astrobiology. We, we have so much to learn, helioscience. I've never fully understood why Earth science isn't part of planetary science, but to NASA they are. Um, yeah, someone, as Shift yeah. goes, get fucked Space Force, Dr. Pamela. She didn't say that, but I'm pretty sure that, yeah. She, she probably shares this. I don't want to speak for her, but she is spot on. She is. Yeah. No, absolutely. The I don't know if any of you saw me doing live coverage of the um, announcement uh, Trump made about winning a space force. But after I was done with that coverage, if any of you saw my face, you knew that something was seriously wrong in my head. And I literally just went and was sick to my stomach. Well, yeah, no, we were supposed to have our stream that night together. Yeah. And I was too busy puking. So yeah, it, it made me 
physically sick um, just because there's so little money. There is so very little money for science. Yeah. Yep. So you put another thing like uh, space and then, you know, put money towards every, that. That's great. Every new piece of infrastructure, every new building, all those things have long-term permanent bills that we have to keep paying. Right. Right. What about every Elon? launch pad. Yeah. So someone's, uh, Leroy says, what about Elon Musk? What about? Oh, I'm e sure he'll make out like a bandit. They're going to buy his rockets left and right. Somebody has to. Um, he, he's the best game in town. He really is. Jeff Bezos is nipping at his heels. Um, I, I think that future contracts are going to be going to commercial agencies. So just like we saw in the early days, uh, it was Boeing rockets. It was Lockheed rockets. Uh, it was Martin Marietta. Uh, in the future, it's going to be Blue Origin. It's going to be Bigelow for capsules. It's going to be Elon Musk. And they're already looking towards Elon Musk as they plan for uh, future heavy lift Air Force missions. So you think he would actually be totally fine with being like, let's screw space exploration and I just want to go because... Yeah, because it's all about humans in space. Um, I've never... Now, I haven't listened to everything I, Elon said. I haven't read yeah, me everything. Me neither. I have had dinner with Elon Musk. Um, mm -hmm. But... He's a geek. He's an engineer. He wants his technological toys. He appreciates the science, but I'm not sure how deeply concerned he is about scientists losing grant money. That's a good question. Well, I just put the emote up there because you have to, like, the way I look at things is there's so much shit out there that if we don't have a sense of humor about it, we're all going to just be miserable but right there's just some things that cut too close i know but um, I, yeah. I mean the flat earth one too i mean we mean that yeah i'm good with the flat earth one i'm totally good with poking fun at that all day long that one's good yeah the so so thin mint says are we angry that there is a space force as a concept or are we angry that trump is the one responsible for creation of it i'm when angry that uh it has the potential to uh cause NASA in the startup of forming the state space force to have to dedicate its flat budget resources away from paying to do science to instead paying the people who are putting together the policies and infrastructure necessary to create a space force working in um, collaboration with the other militaries. So what I'm upset about is a uh, redirection of extraordinary limited resources that would be necessary in the current budget um, because I know the first things to get cut are the humans doing the science. Right. We keep, we keep the buildings. We keep the buildings. We're good at that. Right. Um, space weapons are idiotic. I don't care who came up with it. <laughs> well, the problem with space weapons is uh, when China blew up a satellite, do you remember with, like all the debris issues that created? Yeah. So when you blow shit up. Yeah. Today, the European Space uh, Association, had, uh, Space Agency, had to move one of their spaceships to avoid it getting clunked with debris. Yeah, and you don't want to get clunked with debris. That's moving really, really fast. Um, we are not a violent species. Most humans live out their entire lives without ever killing a single person. Yeah, I'm good with that. We just like to spend money on it. Yeah, we just like to act like we have, you know, a reason to spend money on that. Yeah. We don't really. With space, like, we need to be having the missions and stuff like that. We need to be going out, um, even in our own solar system, uh, yeah. even beyond that. I mean, there's just a lot of other things, too. Like, would would something – I think someone asked, was it you, Fenmil? You asked if if the those two stars merging uh, or colliding in that 2022 bit – I think there was only about 1,000 light years away. Would we have some kind of gravitational wave? And I don't think so. I don't think the mass mm – -hmm mass of those stars would nothing we could detect yeah nothing we we i mean we have to have pretty decent mass um yeah. involved in a collision oh that was yeah. you k kgc sorry fed it wasn't you um this is why i don't want to make 
I want to make it clear that I'm overjoyed that Trump is doing this because while I do completely agree with you that funding is literally is the literal worst part of this as well as welfare for the people, but think our next president could end this before it begins. If Trump is going to slam money into something stupid, some stupid idea, I'd rather Space Force than another Trump Tower. Well, so the, the problem with a Space Force is if you slash the money from science, you're actually, we're, okay. I, I actually gave a talk back in 1996 that is still utterly relevant today about the first thing that goes when you cut funding to basic research is the senior faculty are like, well, I can't hire a student anymore, so I'll just use what's left of my funding to pay for my summer salary. The next thing that happens is the funding gets slashed a little bit more and you no longer have junior researchers. They go away because part of the gauntlet you have to run to get tenure is you have to prove you can get funding. If you can't get funding, you don't get to keep your job. So now you're only left with the senior people and mm -hmm. you start cutting summer internships and essentially funding cuts kill the young. We are currently at a point in astronomy where my generation is really tiny because my generation came in at, at the end of the dot-com boom when there was no longer any donations going in from all of these booming companies where universities were starting to slash positions because states were cutting funding to universities. And many institutions actually adopted a policy of um, we will shrink departments through attrition, which means when the old person dies, which often happens, or the old person retires, which strangely doesn't happen necessarily as often, um, in some cases, results may vary. Uh, they just don't replace those positions. So you have departments dominated by people nearing retirement until they hit a critical point of not enough people to teach in the department, then they hire a young person. So these jobs are rare. So my generation is extraordinarily scarce. I, at age 44, am often the youngest person in the room. Mm -hmm. That is unheard of in tech companies. And this is because tech came of age during the dot-com boom and after. So different fields have different critical ages that are driven by that point in time when they are booming. Just like you can go to a city and you can see when that city was booming by the period in time that is dominated in the architectural style. So, Right now, we're killing our young. Mm -hmm. We are graduating significantly more people with PhDs than who will ever get a job. That I know of, of the 18 people I went and got my PhD with, well, so let me actually back up and give you worse statistics. Um, when I took my first astronomy course at Michigan State, there were 70 of us in the room. Mm -hmm. Of the 70 of us, three finished. Of the three of us that finished, I was the only one that got into graduate school. Um, of the group of 18 of us that got into graduate school at in the program I was in, the program I was in only had 18 people, uh, not all of us finished and most of us didn't get jobs. And the majority of that group of people left the field at PhD or before. Of those who survived that I know of, um, for a long time, there were only two of us that became professors, and I left my professorship a year ago because life. Right. Um, so of those 18, only one is still a professor. Mm -hmm. So imagine all those programs that went from 70 to one, like my undergraduate program, and then 18 of those one fed into the 18 in my class. Of those 18, only one became a professor. The killing is off. And it's because there's no funding. If, if I lose my two NASA grants that I have currently, mm -hmm. I unemploy a shitload of people. Right. right. And, and so what I'm looking at right now is the potential of having to divert funding from basic research 
to the bureaucracy necessary to create a space force could kill not just my project, but the entire group of over $40 million worth of funding that, that goes to my particular program line. Um, so that's over 20 teams, not just individuals, but teams all across the United States, United States with great geographic distribution. Um, Everybody is being pretty uh, decent right now. So I've seen that. Yeah. So, I mean, so, every, not everybody agrees. So it's, yeah, it's, it's so, so, civil though. So what you have to think about. So if we kill off all of our young, it's bad now. If it gets worse, we're not going to have a generation. Now the funding comes back later in the future. We're going to be left with a bunch of really old people who should have retired the tiniest, sparsest population of people in my generation who are just beat down in a lot of cases. Yeah. And a bunch of babies who don't know what the heck they're doing and need mentoring, and there's just not enough of us around to do it. Yeah, well, actually, there's someone that just said right now in chat, I'm 17 and and really love... Oh, wait, no, and I'm really interested in physics, specifically astrophysics as a career. I love space. But I'm worried about jobs prospects, and I fear I fear I will be unemployed, and or have a hard time keeping a job throughout my adulthood. What should I do? I fear I, it won't work out, especially going along with what Dr. Pamela is saying. Well, so so the thing that my husband says to me about once a week is, except with a Canadian accent, <laughs> you know, if you just got a job in computer science, you could earn four times your salary. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> so, I, you know, I hear that all the time. <laughs> so your choice, having finished your, your astronomy degree, is <clears throat> uh, you leave astronomy and become a wealthy person doing things you may not love, but you have the money to go buy yourself an amazing amateur telescope and do research from your backyard observatory. And this is a route that many people have taken go enjoy astronomy and avoid all the academic stress, all the finance stress of grants, all of the, oh dear God, Trump's tweet just led to one of my programs being canceled. True story. Um, study it. The problem solving you're gonna use is applicable anywhere. I have yet to meet anyone who got a computer science degree and didn't program for fun or other reasons who is worth hiring. So seriously, just learn how to program. You're going to rock yeah. it. Yeah. And know that you are immensely employable, just maybe not immensely employable in the thing you dream of doing. And don't, don't give in to the brainwashing they're going to give you. You are going to be brainwashed that you are an utter failure if you're not a professor at a top research university. And if you become something other than a professor at a top research university, you're going to get crap. I get crap. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, programming's good. Yeah. Real Don't good. Don't consider yourself a failure. Consider yourself a survivor. Yeah. It's kind of what you have to become. Um, yeah. But it is something that, uh, I mean, she does a lot of coding, too. And she does yeah. on her own stream, too. She'll sit down and code and you yeah. know, talk about that. Somebody did ask, uh, what uh, what are your grants for? Like, what, what are you researching or working on? I don't know if, are you allowed to just? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I, um, oh, God, how many different grants do I currently have? Um, math is hard. Um, okay. so let me just run down the list of things. It's easier. Um, I have my largest grant is the grant that play, pays for the primary infrastructure of cosmoquest.org. We are a citizen science platform where folks can come in and we work with teams of scientists who are like, I need this portion of a world mapped. I have this data set that requires pattern matching skills. I have, I have this thing that needs to be done that 
in the past, before we had digital detectors, it might be possible for a professor and five students to go through all the data by hand in a couple of weeks and then spend a year writing up the data and publishing a paper. But because we now have digital detectors, instead of getting a gigabyte or two of data, we're getting terabytes and petabytes of data. And it's no longer possible for a professor and a few students to deal with it. So instead, we're replacing those few students, which we no longer have money to pay for. And the America Compete Act actually says, this is what we're supposed to do to enhance our ability to do science. Um, we're saying, okay, Congress has said, we need to go out and ask you, the public, to do the role that we always asked our students to do before. And so... I beg people like you to please help me map out the craters, the, the other scientifically interesting features on the moon, Mars, Vesta, and even here on our own planet Earth. We, we write the software, we provide research funding to the science teams that we work with, we do the statistical analysis inside. I'm essentially a support scientist working between our lead researchers who have scientific problems and don't have the computer know-how, and our computer team who don't have the science know-how. Right. And I sit in between, and I'm both a coder and a scientist, and I make the thing happen. In addition to that, we also have a specific contract with the OSIRIS-REx mission, where we're developing software that will be used in conjunction with other software packages working in competition, because we don't know what the best answer is, to as rapidly as possible, once the OSIRIS-REx mission gets to its asteroid Bennu, identify... Um, the rock that the mission is going to pick up and bring back to Earth. Uh, we also have a grant to develop software that will be used by teams that are looking for asteroids and need to process their data and measure the exact brightness and positions of the objects they're looking at. Well, it's primary uh, justification, just like the primary justification of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is to study asteroids. It will also be beneficial for studying variable stars and pretty much anything that goes blink or moves in the night. Um, we have additional funding uh, for all of our podcasts that is all donations thanks to you. We actually convert the bits and subscriptions that we get here on Twitch into doing science education and to providing the daily space for you, which is a daily update of the news, and to uh, do use donations that come into Star Strider, buy food. Um, we also turn it into equipment that otherwise wouldn't be covered through our grant. We turn it into, um, I'm not allowed to use US funds to travel to other countries to present our research. So uh, contributions to Astronomy Cast allowed me and contributions to 365 Days of Astronomy allowed its producer, Aviva Yamani, these are all sister projects, mm -hmm. to travel to Japan and present our research there. So all in all, um, we're handling... I don't think I should say how much money, but it yeah. results in a whole bunch of humans across all of these different projects. So when, when I think about Space Force, it's not me being upset for me. I'll be fine. Um, it's, it's me being upset for all the junior researchers that I work with, all the junior programmers I work with, who are doing that thing that it feels like no one gets to do. They're writing software that's going to go find a rock that gets brought back to Earth from an asteroid. You kill our funding, you kill that. Right. Um, and, you know, guys, we can we can have her back on, too, because I know there's a lot of questions that came in. Um, but Homegirl here has been streaming for about three and a, yeah. or six, six and a half hours, and my brain is, like, dying. And I'm hearing this, and I this is, like, this is actually a section that I want her to just talk about in and of itself is just the citizen science so that you guys can actually hear more about this in and of itself. Like, yeah. uh, and when do you actually leave for that, that, that thing? I, I apparently am getting up at seven 30 in the morning to go to the airport and I still have to do laundry. So yes, leaving is probably a good idea. Um, so when will I you be back after two, 
Pots no, pots. no, no. The reason why I really want this to continue, because I know there's people yeah. that had questions. Uh, uh, Mako, you had a really good one. I don't know if I'm saying your name right. You had a few that were really good there. Um, and I wanted to ask, and, and but I think this could like be a whole nother session too with her. Uh, and, yeah. and also talking a lot about the citizen science. Um, I know that, uh, Matt just asked, you know, how do we, how do we help with the mapping? And I want her to sit down and talk to you guys about this. Yeah. Especially Go to on here too. Go to cosmoquest.org. I'll explain all later. Well, and, yeah. And buy and my planet. My planets. Yeah, <laughs> you buy my planets. Please She's just gonna planets. just, just put in front of your face. <laughs> um, but there was good questions, and Thinman also had a good uh, point to, or not good point, but he had comments, and I, I read them. But I, I just again, guys, I really want to be able to focus on that because this yeah. is all really good, interesting stuff. And thank you so much for taking the time, and uh, hopefully, so you're you're going to be traveling tomorrow. Yes. And how long yes. will you be gone? Uh, I get back i'm taking a stupid early flight on sunday because it was cheaper so i will be back 8 40 in the morning on sunday so i'll be doing my normal painting stream stream that's normally on saturdays i'll do that on sunday so i'll be on my stream at 3 p.m central which is 4 p.m eastern 9 p.m london uh 1 p.m pacific on sunday and, and you still have the coupon Monday. code up on Etsy. How long are you keeping the coupon code up for? It is good until midnight. So go yeah. get your planets and support science. Yep. And the coupon code is only good for planets. The, the Etsy store also has my husband's woodwork. He gets grouchy when I sell all of his stuff at a discount. So it's only <laughs> for the planets. <laughs> yeah. So you guys can find her. She also, again, she's on Twitch too. Um, astronomy cast they're on a hiatus or not hiatus do you guys call it a hiatus I yeah like... we call it a hiatus we're on okay. summer break yeah summer break i like that better and um but she's amazing and we will we will pick this up and i will be talking to you probably the whole time you're gone anyways so i will and to i'll be it. on instagram as well so folks catch the pictures of the good stuff yes all right well you take care and i will talk to you, you soon too. okay bye we'll be on the internet yes <laughs> bye-bye bye-bye we both say bye-bye. <laughs>